Sulaiman ibn Abdul Malik, one of our predecessors, he asked a question to a scholar, Abu Hazim. Why is it that we hate the topic of death? He said, because you have built your dunya, you've built your empire, you've made bags full of money, you have built your dunya, and you have destroyed your hereafter. You haven't given that any attention. He said, and naturally, you hate to move from that which is built and established to that which is in ruins. So there you are, racketeering, pimping, hustling, grinding, all for the purpose of building something that you can't hold in your hand. All of it stops at the grave. How much of it can you take to your grave with you when you die? Your inheritors, the people you love, they will be the ones standing in front of your carcass, in front of your corpse saying, take it all off. It's ours now. He goes down with nothing. You go down naked. Not even your underwear they will keep on you. And they will prey upon you. And they will forget you. So after a lifetime's worth of running around, chasing dunya, running the fields from plug to plug, from pimp to pimp, from nitty to nitty, in the end, you go down with nothing. And that is why Al Hassan al Basri, he said, speaking about these people, he said, it doesn't matter how expensive the rides may be that they're upon, and it doesn't matter how amazing their swagger may be. But the shame of sin can be seen from their faces because Allah has promised to disgrace those who disobey Him. This is the promise of Allah. They suffer in this world before the hereafter. How else do they suffer? You will say to me, tell us more about this gangster's paradise. I say to you, they are a people of fear. They are scared. They can't walk a, a straight line on the streets during the day or night without looking over their shoulders because it's going to be somewhere waiting out for them, a pagan to put a Rambo through them, to put a zombie through them. There is somebody you have beef with. You fear that someone is going to snake you. You can't even go to the bathroom without carrying straps with you, a tool in your pocket. Why? Because you're scared. You can't sleep, another brother from Bradford told me. Alhamdulillah, Allah Jalla Jalalu hopefully has forgiven him. He's moved away from this industry. He said, Ali, tell them this. There isn't a single brother I know in this industry except that he can't sleep at night. So they go on benders two, three days in a row, high as a kite, snorting up coke all night just to get two or three hours in. Mental health issues, fear. You know a lot of these people, why they behave the way they do? Why they snort up crack? Why they tattoo themselves? Why they inject? Why they try to find their identity in the music industry? Why they do these things? Because they're broken inside. A lot of them come from broken families. They are lost. What is a man like me gonna do in this world? So they try to find some identity, some pride in this. You, however, as a Muslim, Allah has given you answers. You know, this is the problem. You know the secret to success. You know the potion to happiness. La ilaha illallah. Muhammadur Rasulullah, Allah has given it to you free of charge. Allah asked, Where are you going? Where can you go? Allah asked, Does he not know that Allah can see? You think you can evade him, the king, Al Malik, Al Ma'bud, the supreme, the sovereign? Might is his, power is his, and the sky above you is his, the earth beneath you you walk on is his, the product you're selling is his. The limbs you're using to disobey him, they're his. It's all on loan, it's all on tick, you gotta give it back. Where can you go? That is one authority you cannot evade. Here also I want to give a quick message to our sisters who look up to these boys. That is exactly what they are. They're boys, they're not men. They don't know the meaning of man. Our sisters who look up to these boys, maybe her father had put her under extreme restriction in her home so she sees this roadman, this gangster, and he represents a certain thrill and excitement that she never had in her life. Maybe that's the reason. Maybe it's the money. Maybe it's the car. Maybe it's the display of confidence. These are attractive things to a woman. What is interesting is that that very same young girl, give her one or two years, she will be the one who will turn around and say, it's all a con, it's all fake. But it's too late for me now, she said. She said, the money, that was just an image. That was all rented. The car, the Bentley, an image. It was rented for a three minute, 40 second video. 
and he had no lions in a cage. And his confidence? Yeah, right. She goes, his confidence is riddled with paranoia and anxiety. He can't sleep, taking all sorts of meds. He comes home paranoid, snapping at any creak he hears in the house. She can't have a conversation with him. She says to him, you come home high as a kite every single night. We can't even talk, we can't live. And then he gives her a black eye. And then she says to him, can you go upstairs and see the kids before they sleep? And then he punches her teeth in and he rips her hair out. And next thing we know, we find our sister on the streets, roaming the roads, trying to find a woman's refuge to find some escape. Whilst I don't justify any of this behavior, I find no excuses for it. But I ask my dear sister, who's my daughter, who's my sister, I say, why do you accept this trade-off? Why you overlook that Muslim gentleman of haya, of shyness, a righteous man who works, who brings in halal money to feed you and your children, whose mind is yours, whose wealth is yours, whose health is yours, whose religion is shared with yours, whose children are yours. Why you replace that purity, that khair, that goodness, that upright behavior with a boy who sees nothing but his mirror reflection and pursues nothing but his desires. And I give a message to my young brothers who may feel pressured after time to pretend to be something that he's not because he realizes that as a practicing Muslim, there isn't much demand for your likes. And so he starts to concede and give up some of his principles and starts changing the way he talks and invests in new gear because in the hope of bringing in a girl. I say to you, Akhi, stay patient, Habibi, stay patient. Yeah, be patient because those are not men. Those are boys. What is a man? What is a man today? in the eyes of many of our youth. A man is someone who is wearing a nice doubt, Rolex, a 1,000 pound Armani jacket. He's sat in a Bugatti, a black girl on one side, maybe a white girl on the other side. Two or three Latinos hovering around, girls from high school that they're helping him out in his video, in his fake image, and serving up crack to his community and singing about what he snorts up in the evening. That's a man accordingly, according to many of our brothers and sisters. What is a man? Men are whom Allah Jalla Jalaluhu has described in the Quran when he said the Rijal, Men la tulhihim tijaratun wa la bay'un an dhikrillah. Men, they are those who are not distracted by business and commerce from the remembrance of Allah. Wa iqami salah and the establishment of the prayer. Wa ita is zakah and the giving of zakah. How come? Because they fear a day in which eyes and hearts will turn. That is the day of judgment. They are men according to Allah Jalla Jalalu. Rijal. You want to know what a man looks like? Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passes away, droves of new Muslims, they leave the religion. And they try to change Islam by saying, no more zakah, we don't pay it. Abu Bakr says, we will fight them until they pay the zakah. It's the right of the poor. Nobody agreed with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. The entire Muslim community was against him. Even mighty Umar himself radiallahu anhu, he says, leader of the believers, we're not ready for this war yet. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu grabs him by his clothes, pulls him to his knees, and he says to him, you were a tyrant when you weren't a Muslim. And now that you've become a Muslim, you've become a coward? He said, in Qata'a al-Wahi, normal revelation from Allah. وَتَمَّ din And their religion now is perfect. Do you think I will allow anyone to weaken this religion when I am alive? That is a man. What is a man? I tell you what a man looks like. Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu is busy conquering Egypt. And he struggles to finish the conquering. So he sends a letter to Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar in Medina saying, I need men. Help me finish this job. I need men. I need reinforcements. Umar sends him a letter. He says to him, I'm going to send you 4,000 men. They wait. Four men turn up. Amr ibn al-As, he says, I told you we need men. We, we need reinforcements. You promised us thousands. You've sent us four. He said, I have sent you 4,000 men. Because that is a Zubair ibn al-Awwar. And that is Ubadah ibn al-Samit. And that is Maslama ibn al-Makhlad. And that is Al-Miqdad ibn al-Aswad. Every one of those four men is equivalent to 1,000 men. That's what a man looks like, my sister. And that is what a man looks like, my brother. What is a man? A man is Umar radiallahu anhu, whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says to him, I have seen that the devils of the human beings and the devils of the jinn, they run away from you, Umar. Not a slave to his desires, not a slave to money. 
shaytan was afraid of him. That is what a man looks like. Man, Khalid radiallahu anhu was a man who said that on the battle of Mu'ta, nine swords crumbled in my hand. And no artillery was able to show patience in my arm other than a bit of iron work that I received from Yemen. And Umar radiallahu anhu had to demote Khalid and take him off from his position because he was an unstoppable might in the cause of Allah that people began to forget that victory is not from Khalid, victory is from Allah. That is what a man looks like. Not someone appearing behind a video with rented money, rented apartment, rented jewelry. I don't want to say rented women as well. These are men. What does a man look like? Uthman ibn Abi Talha is a man. Uthman ibn Abi Talha sees our mother, Umm Salama, on her way from Mecca to Medina by herself. They made her suffer. They took away her husband. They disabled her child. They were now in Medina and she's by herself in Mecca. She is detained. Finally, they saw her crying so much. They felt sorry for her. They said, go, go to your husband in Medina. She made her way to Medina. That's a two week trip, by the way, 500 kilometers on foot. Uthman ibn Abi Talha sees her. He said, Umm Salama, where are you going? She said, I'm going to my husband and my children. He said, who's with you? She said, no one except Allah. He said, I will not let you travel by yourself. I will take you. That's a pagan. Look, he has an opportunity now to be alone with a woman, one of the most noble women of the Muslims, all by himself with her in a desert for two weeks. And by the way, he had beef with the Muslims of man. At that time, his dad was killed at Uhud, his four brothers and an uncle. This was an opportunity to do something evil with a woman of the Muslims. They didn't touch her, they didn't try to harass her. And he did that for two or three weeks, making his way from Mecca to Medina, 500 kilometers on foot. Till they got to the gates of Medina, they're now in Quba. He said to her, you see that tribe? She said, yeah. He said, your husband is over there, go and join him. And he waited until she disappeared. And then he turned back 180 degrees, making his way back to Mecca, another two weeks worth of travel in the desert by foot. Was that for Allah? Was that for Allah? Was that for religion? That's a pagan. He's a man. Rajul. Our mother, Umm Salam, she comments, she goes, I don't know of a family who has suffered in the cause of Islam more than my family. And I don't know of a man who is more honorable than Uthman ibn Abi Talha. And Alhamdulillah, Allah honored him with Islam and he took his shahada because a man like him deserves the religion of Islam. These are what men look like. Manhood is about knowing that Allah has rights. Mom and dad have rights. My siblings who look up to me have rights. My masjid has rights. The Muslim community have rights. The non-Muslims have rights. My lungs have rights. My liver has rights. My soul, my health, my mind, my money has rights. And a man is the one who realizes this and gives every one of them their due right, beginning with the King Allah Jalla Jalaluhu and moving down to people. As for boys, they see nothing but their mirror reflection and they pursue nothing but their desires.